Welcome back, everybody. Thank you for being here with me today. I am sitting next to Jeff, the owner, president of Boulder Amplifiers. This is the first time you see an interview with the man behind some of the finest audio components in the world. Thank you, Jeff, for being oh, with me here today. Thank you for coming. Appreciate you giving me the time uh, and uh, just you know allowing me to see what you have going on here. It's been a long time coming. Yeah. I've had a lot of your amplifiers and pre-amplifiers for the last 16 months, I would say. Uh, they've never let me down. Um, I went on record as far as saying that I think you make the best amplifiers built in America. And, well, thank you. And I must say that since my channel is about being raw at times, took a lot of heat for saying that. But I'm sitting here <laughs> saying it again. I do believe that they make... Boulder makes the best amplifiers built in the United States. Okay? So, let's get right into it. Some of these questions are questions that came from some of you, and of course, from me. Questions that are quite interesting, I must say. So, let's get started. So, tell us about the company. When was Boulder founded? We started shipping products in uh, 1984. We had some prototypes before that. We call that the first year. So almost 40 years now we've been doing this. 40 years in Louisville, you have been seven years, correct? It's Louisville. Louisville. But, yeah, sure. Uh, we've been here seven years. Yeah, we originally were in Boulder, but uh, then we wanted to build a building. So we found space in the industrial park here in Louisville, moved in in 2016, and very happy to have 23,000 square feet to do these things we do. Now, some of you may not know, but originally, Jeff started in broadcasting, basically manufacturing broadcast and recording equipment, later transitioning into home audio. To me, that's quite an interesting journey. Tell us a little more about that. Uh, gosh, the, the broadcast was an opportunity for me to uh, move to San Diego and work uh, with Pacific Recorders and Engineering at that time was a big was a well-known company for doing the very best audio equipment in the broadcast world both radio stations and television so we built turnkey systems that were all the way up to the transmitter furniture tape recorders mixing boards uh, everything you needed to do that from there i met dean jensen as i told you earlier and uh, i transitioned out of that business to do my own thing because i was an employee there and started Boulder Amplifiers uh, based on some ideas that Dean and I had. So that's really the transition. Then we, at first I sold them into professional audio, but I discovered it was very difficult to make money selling things to the pros. The pros never have money, in, especially in those <laughs> days. So uh, over time we transitioned into doing uh, home stereo. Now I consider us to be really in the luxury market based on what the Asian customers that we have wanted. Uh, we first started going into uh, Japan in 1989. I've had the same Japanese distributor there for 34 years. Wow. Never knew that. At that time, Japan was flying high. So uh, the other Asian countries, China, Hong Kong, Taipei, Korea, uh, they saw what was happening in Japan and they would follow. After that, we quickly had distributors in those countries as well. So I built the business that we have today by selling first in Asia. That's interesting to know. Uh, tell me something that has been very, very curious to me. Why Boulder amplifiers and not Boulder Technologies? Well, it was uh, 1984. We needed to choose a name, and uh, it seemed appropriate at the time. So, you know, it could have been Boulder anything. But really, around the world, we're just known as Boulder. That's it. And is it Boulder due to the site, you, the city, right? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's right. what I wanted to know. Do you find yourself enjoying more building, designing amplifiers than pre-amplifiers? Uh, it's equal to me. Equal to yeah. you. Anything, anything involving electronics for audio, whether it's a, a phono stage, a pre-amplifier, a power amplifier, and all the sub-circuits as well. There's lots of other stuff that goes on than just the amplifier stages. So that has become my first love, is any of that. So yeah. that's, that's all as you're building, I, I suppose. Feedback. A lot of people want to know about feedback, positive, a lot of feedback. Do your amplifiers have feedback or not? So you want to talk about the F word. Okay. 
Yes, the F word. Correct. The F word. So <laughs> let's give some history to put this in perspective. Please. Otherwise, people just are left in the dark, uh, especially after reading a lot of magazine writers that like to tout things. Uh, feedback is a circuit concept that allows you to set the function of an amplifier stage. This was conceived and used mostly with integrated circuits starting in maybe late 60s, early 70s. And every and they didn't sound good. And everybody thought, oh, feedback's a terrible thing. Listen to this, it doesn't sound good. Well, let's be clear about something. There wasn't anything wrong with the concept of feedback. It was just that the integrated circuits you had at that time to do it were not capable of making the performance that you needed. So once those things started to get better, um, then, you know, today what we have for um, op amps, if you will, uh, is really quite good. And we use them in 1000 series with feedback. Uh, feedback is my friend. I know how to work with it. I've been working with it since the 1970s. Everything in professional is done that way. Okay. So some of the marketing departments have taken over and said, oh, we've got feedback-free designs, no negative feedback, blah, blah, blah. You know, if you show me the circuits, I can show you where the feedback is in those. Because what sets gain is always a pair of resistors somewhere implemented somehow. And it essentially amounts to feedback. But I don't want, I think people should not be scared of it. I think it's time the audiophile community grows up and learns to understand that, you know, I've got thousands of customers that like what we do. They like our sound. And a lot of the performance you couldn't do without feedback, especially if you're driving a, a loudspeaker. I'm pointing to the speakers off camera here, sorry. If you're driving a loudspeaker with a power amplifier, you need feedback in order to maintain a zero ohm source uh, because you're really driving a voltage into the loudspeaker and then the loudspeaker decides how much current to draw at any given moment. Well, without feedback, you, you won't maintain a flat frequency response and you won't have low distortion. So now, uh, we also build you know, you can use those IC op amps up to a certain point and you run out of voltage. So for bigger things like power amplifiers, <clears throat> even our preamplifiers, our high, our 2000, 3000 series preamplifiers, we want a higher voltage rail so we can swing more voltage. We actually build an amplifier stage, a gain stage, which is an operational in function to, to do that. But we have to build it out of discrete parts. You can't buy it off the shelf. So we do a lot of that still, and we've been doing that for mm, since the mid 1990s. One good question here that I I wanted this question asked. Sure. Just for you, Jay. It, it's <laughs> Class A really better than Class AB in your opinion? Um, let's weave that into a discussion about how we approach building amplifiers. Okay. Okay. Sure. What we do on our power amplifiers is we have two stages that are completely independent. We have a first stage that gets most of the voltage gain. And then we have an, and it also buffers pin two and three on a balanced input. We haven't built a product with an unbalanced input since the early 90s. We just don't do wow. that anymore. You cannot get the performance you need without going to balanced cables. You will always have hum and buzz. There's just no two ways about it. Okay. So balance is the only way to go. That's why pros have done it for decades. Okay. So we bring, we have a buffer stage that buffers. It's actually two stages that are married together in a special configuration. We buffer pin two and three, which are the plus and minus inputs off the balance cable. And we look at those. That feeds into the output stage, which looks at the difference between those and then generates the signal into the, ampl into the loudspeaker. Now the output stage because we, you classically want 26 dB of gain through the whole amplifier. But since we've gotten most of the voltage gain in the first stage, the output stage can be very low voltage gain. Now, why is that important? Lower voltage gain in a stage that's got big transistors, which can't move as fast as smaller circuits. You have, you know, you have limited bandwidth, but if you do reduce the gain, you can have a lot higher bandwidth. So we get, we get like 200 kilohertz bandwidth through the whole amplifier in our big amplifiers and a lot lower distortion because guess what? I have that magic feedback word to come back in and correct distortions. And that's how we get really good sound. 
That's the short story on that. What was your other part of this question? I'm sorry. The, Maybe the senior. The movement. importance of cl oh, why? class A versus class, class A versus B. class A B. Most folks yeah. are confused as to which one is the better amplifier topology, which one is more well, musical. Some say it's class A, some say it's class A B. Um, boy, that just really depends on the implementation by a given product. So I think is, I don't think there's any cut and dry answer on that. Uh, class A B means that the transistors can be turning off when you've got a totem pole up. We call it totem pole. So one transistor is turning on, the other one's turning off, and so the current is just going through the upper one, say. So when you have to go to transition the other way, then this one has to turn off and this one turns on. Okay, why is this a problem? Well, it's the transition that you can generate a little bit of crossover distortion or notch distortion. There's all kinds of names for it. So the real question is, how low is that? Well, in our Class AB designs, which is 800 series and 1000 series, we actually have enough uh, feedback in the output stage that we can reduce those distortions to, you almost can't really tell. I mean, if, I, if we really set it up to where you were comparing a 1000 series and a 2000 series power amp blind, you might have a really hard time telling the difference. Wow. Yeah. Now in 2000, 3000 series, we do Class A BIOS, but we have to do a trick. Because if you don't, you wind up with a room heater. Technically, class, yeah. a, class A means you're going to have the idle currents through those transistor pair on all the time, regardless if you're using delivering that current out to the loudspeaker. Well, you're going to wind up with a you know five kilowatt room heater. Nobody wants that. So we have a sliding bias scheme that we've used since the 90s that adjusts the bias as the as the demand calls for it, and that's why we're able to do Class A performance without. Uh, having a room heater. So it has to do essentially with the, the way you implement the technology. So there is really no right or wrong, a, wrong answer when it comes to class That's A. Correct. Yeah. Class A being an unshell. Mm -hmm. Now, we all know class A is highly inefficient. It, 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 most designs anyway, to your most point. Design. Traditional designs. Room heaters, yeah, okay, traditional. which I have lived with for a long time. <laughs> my lower legs sweat. My wife doesn't show up in the room. Nobody wants to hang out with me, okay? <laughs> so... This brings me to another question. Will we ever see Class D here in Boulder? Is that something that has ever crossed your mind? Because no. it seems like a lot of people are looking at that. Class D, you do, Class D is basically a switching output so that you're, it's a whole different kind of topology where you are um, creating a signal by, by pulses. And then you have to filter out all the high frequency crap that comes out after it. Uh, the only reason Class A is ever really done is one, economy. Right, correct. You yes. could get a lot more power for the, the money. Okay, but that's not about performance. So it's, that's never the first thing. So if you want performance, you don't go there and do that. So we don't have any intention of doing that. No intention. Do you have any intention of doing, and I've seen a lot of these now out and about, battery operated preamplifiers no expand on that please um we have power supplies <clears throat> i think maybe people wanted to do battery operated thinking that the floating nature of it would be better for grounding and stuff and connections i think that it's short-sighted because if you know how to do grounding and this gets into signal path and grounding inside a chassis, then you don't need to go to a battery operated to do that. Um, a large part of the sound of the sound quality of Boulder isn't something you can see. It isn't how big are the heat sinks and what is how many capacitors and how big are the transistors. It's really the way the PC boards are laid out, which you won't be able to tell by looking at. Right. It's really where things are grounded inside the chassis, which you'd have to really be good at to figure out what we do. Um, with all that, there's no reason to do a battery operated one. That's just more complications and future failures. It's interesting that you see, uh, say that because I have owned quite a few of those right now. And of course, uh, the narrative on the street is lower noise floor with a battery. You don't have the interference of being on the grid. Uh, the battery is completely isolated, so mm -hmm. therefore it's a lot more immediate. There, there are many, many different narratives. 
that's why I was asking that I wanted yeah, your answer. I understand, but you know, you take one, any one of our preamps or phono stages and you put it up against any of that, and noise floor-wise will come out quieter. Uh, we don't have interference coming off the mains. We don't have any troubles with that at all. Okay. How important is the external, the construction of a component? I'll give you an example. I did a test recently with two amplifiers where one brand, Brand X, had a lot of rattle on the chassis. The heat sinks made this weird noise when you tap it with the metal. Um, and your amplifiers don't make any noise. They're literally a boulder. Like you tap on them and it's a, a block. So my question is, does it make a difference in your opinion sonically, the rigidity, the construction of an amplifier? Some say, listen, not really, just have thick aluminum all around, bolts, create your rectangular shaped chassis and stuff everything in it because the outside doesn't really make a difference. Well, you don't want things vibrating. That's never good. <laughs> I mean, look, the original TO3 metal transistors that we did, they were this metal shell and inside was two pins and they would take a wire bond and they'd go from one pin to the actual chip and take another and the other uh, lead out and go to the chip and then they put a cap on it and they were just in their air like air and wiggling if you fired those up at 20 kilohertz you could hear them scream sometimes just a little bit the newer transistors we use now they're all epoxy injected black packages you don't have it and it can vibrate um, in our chassis designs there's a principle called constrained layer dampening all our top covers we will have uh, a dampening material and another plate that screws to the top cover so that it will dampen the top cover it's kind of like uh, taking a spoon if you hang it in the air you tap it it'll ring right and if you grip it harder it won't ring as right much. but your finger is the dampener because it's soft right okay yeah. coincidentally and our i think you went through and saw the way we put a, a heat sink board Yes. Onto uh, a, a heat sink. Okay. Uh -huh. And so there's these bars that we have that with uh, an insulator and then a gap pad material that press down onto the transistors. Well, we did that because of ease of, of assembly and repair. And we don't have to put all those little screws in there. Logan probably told you. But it also happens that that is like a constrained layer of damping where it's holding all the transistors and, and dampening them. And so you, those aren't ringing either. So we do a lot of that, but some of it's coincidental, like I said, for that. So no, you really don't want things moving around. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's not an acoustic device like a speaker, but still, nobody likes that. Right. Speaking of speakers, perfect segue oh, into this next <laughs> question. Oh dear, okay. Okay, I know you all know that they use Focal Grandi Utopia here in the sound room. I'm literally looking at them right now, okay? You sure you want to talk about this next? I, I, okay. <laughs> He said to me, off camera, something that I need to make sure he repeats. Okay, so I'm putting him on blast. He has to say it. He said to me that one of the main reasons, I'll let you articulate it. Let me, let me tell you. Can oh, you please babe. tell him why you selected Focal and you talked about the room? Let's leave it at that. Go ahead and let, because I think that was so important. Okay, I think that so often people say, well, have you heard this speaker or that speaker? And they don't talk about the room. Uh, the, speak, the, the room is the other half of your speaker. I mean, the speaker and the room have to work together. Now, I'm not, I don't make speakers. I have no desire. Uh, but you have to get those to work together. Some speakers work well in a live room. Some speakers work well in a dead room. There's few that work in both, probably. Uh, coming out of broadcast, I always like semi-dead rooms. Not real dead, not an acoustic chamber, but semi-dead. Because I, like to, I don't really want to hear the room. You know, some people like that. Ooh, my room sounds so good. Well, I don't want to hear the room. I want to hear the music. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we have in this room, which we'll do some pictures later, I guess, we have uh, simple acoustic materials. The walls have panels of two-inch mineral wool, medium-density mineral wool. That'll, that'll grab mid-range and up. It won't do anything for bass. Don't kid yourself. Uh, so then in the ceiling, which we have, we built this building, and we did this purpose-built room. The very real top of the, the roof in this room, the ceiling in this room, is like 13 feet tall. And this room is about 26 by 30 feet. Okay. There are no parallel walls in here. The side walls, even the roof is at an angle. Everything's at an angle. So that reduces the cue of the resonance of the base. Well, 
What we did on the ceiling is we have a foot deep of fiberglass, just the kind of fiberglass you'd find in your attic in a house. Um, loose fill kind of fiberglass. This acts as a base absorber. So it'll take out the resonance of the, of the deep base down to a certain point, maybe 50 hertz or so. Now, why is this important? What I learned in doing broadcast was, and in around recording studios, is if you want to really have good vocal clarity, mid-range clarity, you don't want the bass to be strong and muddying up the mid-range. And most people yep. don't realize that these two do affect each other. Yep. So, you know, by reducing the mid-range, you're going to get an overall clarity that I've never found any other way to do. So that's what I have in here. Now, why Focal? These speakers I bought 10 years ago because I got a chance to hear them with our electronics, and I realized that they were better than a lot of people thought because previously I heard them on other electronics that were not so good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it became a happy marriage, and when I put them in a room, this is a previous sound room, which was done the same way. Uh, when I put them in their sound room, uh, everything sounded normal. It, it, you know, there wasn't any too much bass boost or anything like that. Uh, so in here, it's really a flat representation. We are trying to reproduce music, not trying to tweak it. So that's worked out well. I've had other speakers that, uh, which we won't go into brands, that didn't work so well because they didn't have enough bass. Now those speakers would probably work well in a live room, like with windows and hard surfaces, fine. But that's not the way I want to listen. So it's personal preference. Sure. And I always tell people loudspeakers are distortion of choice. You have to choose what you want to be wrong with the speaker that you're buying because they're never as perfect as we can do at electronics. You talked about measurements. Have you had this room measured? To be honest, no. No. Okay. Yeah. And when you build electronics, when you build your amplifiers, do you ever voice them? Or do you, do you, because there is some of that that happens with some brands. No. Never. So you basically we do the build best. A, we build a product that makes the output signal resemble the input signal. So you don't try to change as, yeah. as neutral as possible. As neutral as possible. Anything. Yeah. That's something I've said many times to my audience. I've always said it. And those of you who have connected uh, with me said that one of the things that I have it just instantly picked up about bolder products is that they are like a blank sheet of paper. There's nothing in it. You draw however you want for the product to sound. Do you want it to sound like tubes? You buy a tube deck. Do you want it to sound musical? You change your cables. And the reality is it's up to you to do that. The problem is that I just feel like at times many of my audience, many of my audience, most of them actually, I would say, don't understand that with neutrality comes more responsibility because you're hearing what the system is. One of my tests that I tell people for many years is if you want to know how good a system is, when you play different recordings from different artists, different producers, the more differences you can hear between those recordings, the better the system. Right. That because it's saying it's it's saying that the system is neutral. And if you and you may not know this, but because I have, you know, it's something that I have articulated on my channel in the past. There are amplifiers or preamplifiers that are made to sound a certain way. What happens is they homogenize every single recording. Everything sounds the same. You cannot tell a difference between classic rock and jazz. It all sounds the same. And that's okay because it, it is a matter of preference at the end of the day. Kind of like what he was saying. Speakers are such a personal thing too. Uh, but the problem with that is that you begin to color everything to be the same. I always use this analogy. It's like you're putting ketchup on all your meals. That's not, my analogy. Well, not going to be able to, you can buy a $300 or $400 steak. And if you put ketchup, you killed it. So I am in alignment with that. Well, I always, I always say that, you know, it's like tubes. What, why do people like the sound of tubes? Well, because basically they sing along. You do. And everybody says, oh, well, the second harmonic's on pitch, but then the rest of it's not so good. Well, if you actually got into the math of it and looked at the musicalness of it, the third harmonic is also on pitch. I don't know if you're musical, but, you know, the second harmonic is an octave. Okay, so if you play a C, you get a C. That's an octave. Okay, if you have a fifth interval, you get a G, except it's an octave higher. So the third harmonic comes right out at the fifth interval. 
Well, what's the fifth interval? It's in every major, minor, and so many curves, 90% of what you listen to. I don't care what kind of music, you're going to have a fifth interval. So that's why tubes get away with it. They will be adding these things where they sing along, and people go, oh, listen to the bloom or whatever. Okay, well, it's your money if that's what you want, but I think you should understand what you're buying. And it is like you said, except I, I, the way I say it with tubes is, you go have a five-course Italian meal, and you take the sugar bowl, and you put it on every course. After a while, you get sick of it. You do? Okay. You do. And, um, and you know, it is something that I always enforce. You want to have the most neutral electronics, but assuming responsibility, the responsibility of making sure that you're not taking, you're not cutting corners. You're not using, mm. you know, your power is horrible. You have, you know, a terrible room. You know, I just don't believe in using electronics to compensate deficiencies elsewhere in your system. Um, and uh, I've learned it's hard to learn that it took me a minute, it took me a while to understand it. But after again, after living with, you know, components like components you build and understanding what neutrality is, is all about. And you can make it sound as beautiful as you want, by the way. So the component is simply going to go in the direction in which you want it to go like a race car. It's immediate. It's fast, uh, dynamic, explosive, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but ultimately, you as the driver, you need to know the direction in which you want to go, right? Um, I have one last question for you. Sure. Which is a um, question that I have been thinking about. You were mentioning tubes <laughs> in your early beginning. Yeah. Or at any point in your career, have you ever built a tube component? Anything that you scratched it and never came to fruition for whatever reason? No. Ever. When I was in college, I, I worked at the Hi-Fi store in Phoenix. We were the Macintosh dealer. So I repaired a lot of tube amplifiers. Okay. That's probably why I didn't want to do it because A, it's hot and B, it's high voltage. Right. And and, and then you get it working and it wouldn't stay. You know, it, tubes age. Our designs, nothing ages. Nothing will change the sound over time because the, 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 the clarity of the sound is built into the circuit design. And it doesn't depend on the age of a transistor. They really don't age much. As long as you don't stress them, they really don't age. But uh, we don't have those problems. So it's designed out. This last question is uh, it's one last question that I have. One more last question. It's, it's, uh, it's uh, <laughs> um, do we have anything? Let me rephrase that. Why is it that most of your amplifiers, or in general, generally speaking, most of your products stay as current products for longer than five years, which is we typic what we typically see from other brands. They discontinue them after five years. Well, they're 15 years before you retire the 2060, I believe. Easy. Maybe longer, actually. Yeah. Um, well, you know, things... The design of amplifiers is pretty subtle. I mean, there isn't a lot that changes. It, first off, it's not like somebody's inventing a new power transistor somewhere. That, that was set up like 30 years ago. Uh, everything we do is bipolar. You had asked that question earlier. We don't do MOSFETs because they're not as reliable, and I don't like the circuit topologies. you got to go through a lot of gyrations to make MOSFETs work. But uh, once the design is there, it's pretty solid, and it's not, you know, we have to do upgrades. We did upgrades from 2000 series to 2100 series for one main reason. And that is, we went from all through-hole parts, meaning you drill holes in the board and put leaded parts in, to surface mount. And so that series became, that was the main driver for that. Uh, we get better reliability, better uh, productivity from surface mount than you could through-hole. Um, but you know, market demands say, oh, we gotta have something new. Magazine reviewers, maybe influencers like yourself, <laughs> got to have something new to write about. Yeah, yeah. I go like, what do you want me to do? You know, all my good ideas are there. I don't know. We have nuances that we do. So there'll be, there'll be upgrades, but nothing earth shattering. You know? Nothing. So you feel basically that there is no reason for those changes to be occurring every five years. You feel advancements are not significant enough for people to start. Cause I see it all the time. You'll see a product A, now A S E special edition. All of a sudden three, three years later, they found a way to insert a new capacitor that makes it sound better. I see it all the time. And I don't know if it's a way of shaking people down, hustling people. I just want to be honest here, better, you know, and, and not really, you know, hide anything. And, and so I was wondering, that's, that's why my question. Better you say that than me. 
you know, I, I don't want to speak about competitors. I really don't. But, uh, you know, we have plenty of customers. We have plenty of business. We're so busy these days. I don't feel the need to say, well, here, I'm going to go spend. You can spend $5,000 and it'll be magically better. I don't do that kind of thing. You know, I came out of broadcast. Everything had to work. And we try to make it work from the get-go. So, um, you know, this kind of this kind of technology has been around a long time now, decades. And it's not like you're going to have some new approach to amplifying a signal to drive a loudspeaker. I mean, thank God loudspeakers are what they are because if, if we if they didn't need us all of a sudden, somebody created a new speaker that only took half a watt, well, I'd be out of business. <laughs> so, you know, but it, it really hasn't changed. And, and so I don't know what people are expecting. I know they always want to have something new. There are certain customers that just have to have the new thing. Okay. I don't know what to tell you, but, you know, we'll always have revisions over some time, of pe- time period, but is a rule around magazine reviewers that if it was if it was more than five years old they wouldn't review it. Okay, that was a big impetus for wow manufacturer to come out and say here now if I do this then I can get ink on paper. That was a traditional problem. Yeah. That is interesting. But I will say this though, we, you all watching me and myself yeah. included, we are guilty of wanting to buy the latest and greatest. Sure. So we are also guilty of a lot of brands constantly releasing new versions, new iterations of their products. Because we don't want to buy the same thing. I'll give you a perfect example, and I'll say it. Revell Salon 2, those loudspeakers that you have seen throughout, I mean, the last 20 years, they have not been replaced, but the desire, desirability factor of that loudspeaker is very low because it's been around too long. It's kind of like it's been around the block. And so I think sometimes we force manufacturers to keep inventing something else in order for them to have sales, in order for them to keep business afloat. Okay, so keep that in mind. At least he's being honest here, and I'm trying to be as honest as possible as well to let you all know what this entire narrative is about. So, I mean, I like to say that we sell performance. We don't sell fashion. You've got other, but you were asking me about heat sink materials. Yeah. We didn't go there yet. We but, no. We, but we don't sell fashion, you know. That's interesting. That I, I never heard of, about that. But that's a nice way of putting it, you know. So, yep. I don't know if you wanted to talk about your copper question or not. Well, let's 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 talk about it. Let's, let's go right into it. Okay. What kind of heat sinks? What kind of material do you use? Because well, a lot of it goes around yeah. copper being the greatest conductor of heat. Well, let's put some numbers to that. Uh, aluminum is cost effective. It's only what we use for heat sinking. Uh, copper can be magic under certain things like in a, a, a computer where you need more conductivity. Well, okay, let's talk about conductivity in metals. Copper is about twice as dense as aluminum, weighs twice as much per cubic whatever. All right, that also means that the heat will travel twice as fast through it. Now, when you talk about building a heat sink design, You've got to get the heat from the little chip into the package of the transistor through this insulator into the heat sink and from the heat sink to the air. What's the biggest restriction in all that? The answer is we call it thermal resistance, just like Ohm's law. Mm -hmm. We call it thermal resistance between the heat sink surface and air is the biggest problem. So you just need a lot of surface area. The amount of the amount of heat loss that you have, the amount of temperature uh, drop that you would have across the actual aluminum or copper or anything else for a heat sink is very small in per- percentage, maybe less than 10% in the total picture of uh, getting the heat out of, the, out of the chassis. And it's really a heat dissipator. Everybody says heat sink, but it's supposed to be a dissipator. dissipator. So when you change that from aluminum to copper, you spend a lot more money for copper and then trying to process it and deal with it is a headache that I don't want. And you get very little for all your effort and your expense. So we're happy to stick with aluminum. It's the most uh, cost-effective method. Great to know. Well, okay. well, there you have it, guys. I hope you all have enjoyed this amazing interview, this opportunity to interview Jeff here. Boulder Amplifiers in Louisville, Colorado. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you for, for coming. Oh, yeah. I'm really, it has been an amazing, astonishing experience. Can't thank you enough for this opportunity. Okay. And hopefully we can do this again in the future and see what else Boulder has 
come back Down in 10 years. <laughs> Thank you all. Continue to subscribe. Until next time, peace.